everyone and welcome to Sankalp 2021. Thank you for joining our session. This session is incentivizing regenerative agriculture in the developing world. And our moderator for the panel today is Mr. Santosh Singh. Santosh is the director of uh, Energy, Climate Change and Agriculture here at IntelliCap. And he's also the co-lead of the India Agriculture and Food Systems Circularity Action Platform. So uh, before I pass it on to Santosh, uh, just wanted to attract your attention to a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please do keep yourself muted throughout the length of the session. Uh, you can unmute, my, un unmute yourself when the Q&A session begins. Uh, you can use the chat box in the meantime if you want to uh, address any questions uh, specifically for our speakers. And uh, secondly, Sankalp is a global summit, uh, so it would be great to know where all our audience is coming from. So do introduce yourself in the chat, uh, tell us where you're from and get to know your fellow participants as well. So thank you and Santosh, over to you. Thank you, Tanvi. And uh, a very good morning to all of you uh, participating from different locations, different time zone to this season. Uh, my name is Santos. As uh, Tanvi introduced me, I have been uh, working in the development space for last uh, 16, 17 years in multiple roles and have been witnessing the agriculture transitions in different capacities. So very excited to host this uh, uh, very knowledgeable and esteemed panel. Uh, before I go on to kind of introduce my panel, I just wanted to set a few contexts for this, uh, you know, conversation that we are engaging in. I think uh, uh, I'm not going to highlight the importance of agriculture. We have done that. We know that it, it, it goes without saying. But I want to highlight a few contexts that, uh, you know, the agriculture is going to be seen in that. And uh, one that context is that in the context of climate change. You know, if you look at the buzzword today is the climate change and agriculture. Uh, has a very, very unique positioning of being a contributor to the climate change as well as a victim of climate change, vulnerable to climate change. Uh, although the, the contributor to the climate change part is a bit, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, overplayed if you look Indian context, because Indian agriculture is, you know, very, very uh, kind of minuscule impact in terms of the global uh, greenhouse gas emission. If you look at the global context, I think uh, for those who are not aware of India's climate footprint, uh, uh, you know, we have per capita 1.8 ton of carbon footprint vis-a-vis -vis the global average of 4.4 ton uh, per capita. So we are very, very low. Uh, but I think uh, for this panel, what we are going to discuss is that there's a global discourse uh, that is focusing on that how agriculture can be a solution to many of the climate change problems, how we can rather than being emitter to become the source for uh, you know sequestering carbon and become regenerative agriculture so i think uh, uh, somebody rightly pointed out on the journey towards sustainability if sustainability is getting break even regenerative is going to be you know positive in terms of profit so uh, with that focus you know what we are looking at regenerative uh, this session is primarily focused on the developing nation context because the developing nations are the home for majority of the small landhold farmers who are, you know, one of the biggest victim of climate change uh, when it comes to agriculture practices. To give you a context, you know, if we take the climate change projections uh, uh, there, 20, uh, by 2050, 30% reduction in the yield would happen because of the climate change to small landhold farmers. So that's the huge, huge thing we're talking about. Regenerative agriculture could ease that way out, making them more resilient, more productive, as well as uh, more climate friendly. So, so that's the context. Now, having said that regenerative agriculture is going to be a buzzword uh, going forward, uh, it is yet not mainstream in the discussion. It is not mainstream in terms of practice on the ground. Many of the agriculture stakeholders are not yet very much aware of the things. But the two things that I have uh, witnessed is A, the small landhold farmers have a very, very difficult task to transition to regenerative agriculture primarily because their inability to invest into this. Regenerative agriculture has an upfront cost, both in terms of uh, financial as well as in terms of uh, you know, investing into capacity building, skill building, etc. So, so that's one part. Second part is that uh, the ecosystem that is required to make this transition happen, the support services, the policies, the technical know-how, the, the capacity, all are in a very, very early stage. In fact, they are almost non-existent. We are having this early discussion. So, uh, you know, in this panel, what we want to do is that over the next 60 minutes, we want to start a series of the discussion from this Sankalp, and this will be the first of its kind, 
uh, is that how we can think of regenerative agriculture from a small landholder farmer's perspective, how we can help them transition. And uh, I have scheduled this panel for, uh, say, in three uh, rounds of discussion, uh, starting with opening remark, where I will invite my speakers to come and talk about uh, their experience, their institutions, the work they are doing that is relevant to uh, uh, regenerative agriculture. And uh, I have three panelists with me, and I'll quickly introduce as I invite them to uh, kind of speak, uh, but uh, just to kind of quickly give uh, the idea who are the panelists. I have uh, Gajanan Ji from Transforming Rural India Foundation, an institution working very closely with the small landhold farmers on the grassroots table, and, and they have the tons of knowledge and experience uh, when it comes to working with small landhold farmers. So I would have him uh, you know, speak in the opening remark. Uh, second, I have uh, Jasmeh. Jasmeh works with uh, IDEA, Sustainable Trade Initiatives, and is working very closely with uh, promoting regenerative agriculture practices with the farmers and has tons of knowledge about the practices in the context, uh, uh, the work they're doing. So she will share that. The third speaker is uh, Mr. Samir Sisodia. Samir is the CEO of Green Matter Foundation, and Samir is working with a number of you know, uh, institutions and the initiative to promote climate-friendly agriculture and climate-resilient agriculture. So he will talk about what uh, you know kind of vision the Green Matter Foundation has and what they are building on to support this causes. So that's the uh, kind of thing. So, if uh, my panelists allow me, I'll invite uh, Mr. Gajanan Rauta to talk about the work TRIF is doing with the small landhold farmers. And if he can share about uh, the context, uh, I think before we push the regenerative agriculture, we need to understand the context of the small landhold farmers, that what they are going through and how they can contribute. So, uh, you know, uh, Gajanan ji, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Santosh ji, and uh, happy to be part of the uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, TRI is an organization, before I go into the context of uh, smallholder farmer and the way we do the work, uh, I think uh, TRI is an organization we work uh, towards uh, smallholder uh, farmers who, who are involved in agriculture, but we believe that there are many pockets within uh, India, uh, which we call as uh, stranded India, which are more uh, backward in terms of different uh, parameters. And uh, there, the tragedy and the backwardness is high, and uh, it, it's it's with uh, all dimensions, be it governance, be it uh, uh, asset, be it investment, be it industries. In all dimensions, uh, there are challenges. So TRA as an organization believes in this philosophy that uh, there are three core components who should come together and work so that uh, the whatever intervention we do, it is sustainable and will bring more. Uh, uh, gain or more economic uh, social prosperity. And we, those three terms are Samaj, Sarkar, and Bajar. I mean, the society, the market, and the government. All three need to come together and work you know, for those uh, part of the country, which will bring uh, you know multidimensional development in that area. So we uh, do uh, some uh, work along with the community. At the same time, we also partner with the government ecosystem so that uh, the impact can be brought at uh, scale. For example, I currently work with the National Rural Livelihoods Mission, where the entire focus is to uh, augment the livelihoods of uh, uh, women who are part of the self-help uh, group. Uh, so this is a brief about uh, TRI as an organization, what we do. Coming to the, uh, the smallholder farmers context in, in terms of uh, how the farmers are facing different challenges and how uh, what is their existing status in, in India. Uh, if you will see the entire uh, uh, country, uh, 18, almost 18% 18 of the GDP is contributed uh, through agriculture. However, if you will see, the, there are a lot of challenges at every stage of the value chain, be it in the pre-production stage or in the production stage or even in the post-production stage. And if you will see the yield, it is in the global benchmark, uh, from the global benchmark, it is almost 35% to 50% lower than the global benchmark in terms of yield. And that's the starting point where uh, you know smallholder farmers challenges or the 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 difficulty that they face multiplies from that uh, level only. And uh, again, if you will see the entire production of vegetables and crops, only three percent of uh, those uh, uh, crops are being processed. So there is a high level of a deficiency in terms of supporting farmers 
to aggregate, add value, and push it into market so that they can have a better price realization. So these are a bit of challenges. And if you will see from the land holding point of view, you will see almost 80 plus, 80 plus over and over 80 percent of uh, our farmers are either uh, marginal or uh, small farmers. That's that's the you know uh, kind of uh, uh, scenario that we have in India. And when we talk about uh, challenges that there are nine different uh, you know challenges that all the small uh, hold of uh, agriculturists face and uh, that is range again in these three stages pre-production production and post-production so if you will talk about the pre-production stage i think mostly it is uh, you know lack of uh, demand driven planning high cost of planting materials uh, high cost of uh, labor so these are few of the challenges and also different enablers for agriculture, including irrigation facilities, availability of quality seeds. Uh, uh, and during the production, if you will see, irrigation is one of the core challenges that we have. Similarly, the package of practices is applicable when somebody do a uh, commercial farming, but for a small farmer, it is very difficult to adopt uh, the commercialized uh, practices, which we call as uh, package of practices. So very limited resources are available for these small farmers. And uh, again, uh, over dependency on chemical fertilizers because uh, the industry works in a way that farmers look forward for a higher degree of production. So that's again one area which uh, I think is during the production stage, that's a kind of a challenge. And coming to the post-production stage, again, uh, the institutional setup, the buyer and seller meet where it happens, well, the access to market and uh, also in the value chain, aggregation, storage and processing. The infrastructure is uh, very poor because again, the collectivization has not happened uh, pretty well. So these are a few of the challenges which I uh, visualize in terms of small uh, holder agriculturists. And uh, as an organization, what we do to you know uh, 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 cater to those uh, challenges, so uh, we firmly believe that uh, we should work deeply with the community. So the first uh, uh, first uh, engagement is uh, with the community. So we work to collectivize them so that if they come together, then they can actually have a better planning in the entire stage. They can actually have a higher degree of negotiation. So that's one area where we try to engage with the community and improvise the governance as per se. And the second is that there are a lot of local infrastructure which is required for smallholder farmers through mobilizing different government schemes. For example, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. It has a huge budget of almost uh, 100,000 uh, crores. And uh, that, that investment need to be mobilized for those resources so that at the household level assets can be generated at the household level, different practices can be adopted. So that's uh, investment, mobilizing investment from the government and uh, creating assets through that uh, resource is uh, one area where uh, we work so that the smallholders get at least adequate uh, amount of assets at their household level. Uh, the third is that we also go for a cluster-based approach where uh, we feel that if the production volume is high, then it is easier for us to further uh, market it uh, based on the surplus uh, that they have produced. So that's uh, cluster-based production approach is something that we adopt. And the last one is that we have come up with a package of practices for smallholder farmers. And we believe that if a, at a single household level, the livelihood activities can be diversified. For example, uh, if somebody is doing agriculture with a bit of horticulture and livestock, or uh, non-timber forest produced related activities, then that can uh, yield a higher income to the family. So how a small farm holder uh, who, whose dependency is mostly on agriculture, but how can he or she diversify uh, the livelihoods base? So that will yield them a higher income. So the, the approach is that we identify households create a profile of that household and based on the kind of risk taking capability to design a program where different diversity livelihood activities uh, can be taken up. Then we have designed very small package of practices which, uh, which can be adopted by the farmers. And uh, the third one is connecting with the market players 
so we have come up with a very uh, good uh, you know i'll just show you a copy of uh, the book which i recently tried to create i think uh, is it visible no so this is i mean uh, when we talk about farmer producer organization it's in a very higher scale but think about a village where there are only 30 to 40 producers how will you collectivize them and uh, give them a better marketplace so in that context we have created uh, a playbook for the community so that they can become a part of uh, a very small producer group they can uh, collectivize all the produce they can uh, scope the market the nearby market they can negotiate with the uh, market players and uh, get a higher uh, price remuneration so that's how tri as an organization uh, works i'll stop here thank you Thank you, Gajananji. I think uh, the context that I wanted to set is that uh, the small landhold farmers require a lot of capacity building support, a lot of handholding, a lot of kind of uh, long term support. And right now, a number of institutions, a number of government programs, a number of initiatives are working towards small landhold farms. Now, in ideal world, we should have a regenerative agriculture baked in into those approaches so that they are moving towards that. We don't have to sift. We have to gradually kind of build the regenerative part into that rather than saying that, okay, now we are going to sift regenerative agriculture. Uh, Indian agriculture is still many farmers are very close to the traditional way of doing agriculture, which can be easily transformed into that. The two, three key takeaways that I have from Gajananji, A, that TRF is working with more than a million small uh, landlord farmers in different uh, uh, sector area, different geography. Second, their program is often kind of tuned to the individual needs of the farmer. They have a profile of the farmer that what is suitable for them. And nothing of this comes at the cost of compromising their immediate income because small landhold farmers, the biggest priority for them is to be able to feed their kind of uh, you know livestock to feed their family and, and the income is paramount that need to be safeguarded. In fact, when we set up the TRF, uh, Intelic at India Circular Agriculture and Food System Platform, the motto was that increasing farmers' income sustainably. So the key is that you cannot focus on the sustainability and ignore the income part because that will not fly. So having this context is very helpful because uh, you know we need to understand that transitioning farmer is a long-term agenda, requires intervention since multiple areas working with multiple institutions and different kind of investment into the ecosystem now having said that i think uh, my next speaker uh, jasmeer who works with idh as a senior program manager landscape and and uh, idh is a sustainable trade initiatives and they have been working in multiple value chains uh, so with jasmeer here you know i wanted to take this conversation a bit more into a bit of uh, the details that how certain programs are trying to bring regenerative agriculture uh, into practice. What are the things they are doing? How they understand the context? How they design the strategy, the interventions? And, and that could help us understand this uh, space a bit better. So just may over to you, you can uh, talk about uh, you know some bit of work that regenerative agriculture domain you have been doing uh, about the institution as well as the program that you have and probably pick up the small uh, farmer's narrative that how we can get the small farmer to move towards the region of agriculture. So what do you? Great. Um, thanks for that, Santosh. And thanks for having me here as well. Um, for everyone on the call today, just as a quick snapshot uh, for the ones who aren't familiar with IDH, we essentially are a public-private partnership facility. Uh, we work across 50 plus countries or so. Our mandate really is to drive business models, investment cases, um, to drive market transformation in agricultural commodity sectors, but also selected landscapes. Um, and by doing all of this, have really a deeper impact on better incomes, primarily for smallholders, on better environment across our landscapes, as well as on better jobs um, in the supply chains. So um, basically, I want to start off with Santosh today's little revisiting how region agriculture, both as a topic emerged for us, where the ask came from and how we're working on it. Um, and I think really in the last couple of years, uh, not news to all of us, there was a significant, um, I think, revisiting 
um, of what businesses, governments, societies want to do uh, to respond to not only climate crises, but also the sort of crises we saw emerging out of COVID-19 hitting the world as it did, and then even more disproportionately in countries like ours, um, in agriculture and in, for example, labor sectors. It's basically the shared values that also underpin this and for us, some of the shared values that we should look at when we even approach the topic of region agriculture is how do we not disconnect uh, the income uh, as a central focus? It's something Gajanan referred to as well, but definitely you cannot separate those two conversations. How do we integrate or at least create a more inclusive space for both men and women, equal opportunities, even at a production and agricultural level? How do we look at the systems which regenerate? Yes, but not at the expense, it's profitability, not at the expense of the planet, but also it's the food systems themselves that we propagate, which should protect ecosystems, enhance biodiversity and so on. And lastly, I think given where we are in India and with the small farmers that we work with very much across the country, um, what we're very conscious of is how should, how should agricultural production and food systems um, either mitigate or at least become more adapted to climate change. And I think those were some of the, the early factors which opened up a lot of um, you know, starting points for us when we started to work on Regen Ag. Now, it so happens that with the companies we work with, with different sort of partner organizations, even more conversations about how region agriculture could possibly be uh, a starting point of not a solution to several SDGs. For example, looking at global food security, healthy diets, um, 2.2 and 2.3 on sustainable food production systems, um, SDGs on restoring degraded land, ultimately also looking at land degradation, uh, neutrality as an objective. All of these, uh, you know, I mean, region agriculture as a system has the potential to contribute uh, significantly to those. And now IDH basically enters this space by looking at the systems change of it all, and which is why we work across all three spectrums. One is the improving of sector governance. So within a sector, within a landscape, how do we activate connections across different stakeholders? Um, how do we work with businesses? So businesses who want to make their supply chains more resilient, who want to, you know, sort of create a more inclusive uh, supply chain by integrating smallholders. How do we make a business case to really take up regenerative production systems at that level? And finally, of course, how can we put the farmer right at the center of all these conversations? to make sure that it works for the Indian farmer, the smallholder farmer, irrespective of which system they're in. Um, when we started to work, you know, keeping this in mind and with a number of stakeholders, we also realized that even though region ag is picking up as a topic of interest, and now you hear it everywhere, it's still not entirely well understood in terms of its end outcome. And that is why the first thing we started to do with IDH was actually get together a consortia of partners. Right? So we worked with New Foresight, with SEAT, which was uh, Biodiversity International, with South Pole. And we started really answering some of those questions saying, how do we transition to regenerative agriculture at the smallholder level? And we did this actually starting with our programs in coffee in Uganda and Kenya. And now we're looking to take up more of this outcome-oriented approach in our cotton-based landscapes in India as well. So essentially where we uh, landed at this point is also uh, we're looking at you know, a regenerative ag system, and that's what I wanted to sort of put up now, which is holistic in nature, right, which has these shared values that inspire us, which is something I shared earlier. Um, but it is also deeply dependent on a few different dimensions and principles. You know, we look at the fact that Regen Ag is deeply context specific, right? What works 
not only in India, but in a particular location in India, you know, one village, one block, will need to be adapted for its approach when you take it elsewhere, because the focus is on the outcome and not on the specific activities that you may want to take up. Um, it's also about driving resilience at the smallholder level, something we've spoken about um, already, but it's also something that has diversity at its core. So when we think of our existing production systems and we question um, what level of good agricultural practices can drive those outcomes, it really does require a complete paradigm shift on focusing not only on yields and intensification, but looking at how can you make a business case for more diversity on a small farm? And uh, I think that is those are the areas where I'd want to go into deeper um, you know, in the next, you know, sort of areas of questions and so on. But just coming to India and, and a little bit of what we're looking to do in Madhya Pradesh, which is where we're working on our uh, landscape program with the Laudas Foundation and with uh, WWF. At the moment, we're really engaging actually with local agri-universities, including Indian Institute of Soil Sciences, who we've engaged with uh, recently, but the whole endeavor is exactly this, creating a very local contextual model. What we have to learn to do is adapt that model as we shift from geography to geography. But the outcome, which is both a balancing act of uh, rejuvenating soil, keeping soil at its core, but at the same time, not at the cost of profitability of the farmer, not at the cost of income of farmer household. Those are principles we are going to retain uh, in the approach that we take. So uh, let me sort of pause here now and uh, yeah, we'll revisit some of this. Thank you, Yasmeer. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the work that you did in coffee uh, value chain and looking at the, uh, you know, different value chains in India, I think that's one approach where we are kind of looking at more specific focus uh, in terms of the outcome, the practice that can be changed. But I think, uh, we are looking at a system where every farmer should move towards regenerative practices, irrespective of the value chain they are working. And that's the kind of long haul, that's a long you know, a time frame that we're looking at, but good to start and think of the commercial interest being preserved while we bring the regenerative agriculture practices into the mix, because that's the key concern. Anybody who has worked with small landhold farmers, the conversation not to start with what we are going to do with, for the planet. The first thing that, what is going to cost me? And then I'm a strong believer that public goods should not come at a private cost. You cannot force the small landhold farmers to take the pain for the global you know, emissions, which he had no, uh, or she had no role to uh, contribute. So I think it's a very uh, good that you are kind of bringing good practices and certain value chain that could be later replicated. But moving on to my next speaker, uh, Samir, Samir Hage, the Rainmaker Foundation, and Samir has been working in personal capacity as well as, a, you know, the uh, head of the Rainmaker Foundation to support the transitions to better, I would not use the word regenerative, but I'm saying that climate friendly and climate resilient agriculture, the larger bucket. And Samir, it would be great if you can talk about your experiences, the Rainmaker Foundation's vision, as you hear from my previous speakers that it requires a number of stakeholders to come together and build the capacity to realize the goal. It's not going to be done in a you know, short span of time. It would not be achieved if we don't come together uh, from multiple capacities and multiple perspectives. So uh, if you can highlight about uh, the work that you are doing and also kind of uh, your thinking, I think I was looking at the chat box and you were highlighting that, can we have a repository of such practices that could be made available. Uh, in, in fact, we are in such an early stage that forget about having the repository. We don't even know that, you know, where they exist. So somebody has to kind of, uh, you know, do a research to identify what are the regenerative practices right now in practice. So over to you, Samir, and uh, look forward for your opening remark. And then I'll go back to some specific questions in the second round of discussion. Thanks, Atosh. Uh, thanks for organizing this. I think this is uh, one of the most uh, important discussions to uh, have at uh, at a world scale, not just not just uh, not just India scale. Um, I think I think uh, both uh, Jismeer and Vidanand have covered a lot of ground on uh, setting the context uh, with respect to uh, you know, 
uh, natural farming and regenerative methods, uh, the problems that the small land uh, landholders face today, and then you know how the transition may be achieved. What's what's really encouraging is that uh, you know just just from this panel and and from the chat window, the number of people who are actually involved in it at scale, right? Like it's it's actually I, I I would say it's no longer a fringe. I would say it's no longer uh, something that's an edge case. Uh, it just appears like that because uh, the directories are the saying, uh, you know, we're not we're not uh, coming together and appearing like one force. And I think I think that's part of the problem. And and we and we need to uh, make more noise about this, right? So of course we started our train matter from a uh, climate uh, from a climate inwards lens on this. And uh, we took a slightly more holistic view of the climate uh, issues uh, rather than just reduce it to uh, carbon sequestration and temperature numbers, because those are very downstream ways of looking at the climate problem. Uh, like you said, uh, agriculture itself is uh, one of the root causes of a lot of the changes we have uh, caused in the last few centuries and definitely in the last few decades. Um, then the supply chains associated with agriculture you know, the, uh, the production, the consumption patterns, and so on and so forth. So, and, and as we started to uh, get sucked into this deeper through conversations, through uh, trying to work with the uh, folks uh, at the grassroots, we also realized that these are all linked problems. Uh, like Jasmine was saying, this is linked to food security, to nutrition, uh, uh, to the uh, kind of agriculture we're doing, to the input costs, to the seasonal migrations that we see into the cities, uh, to health outcomes, you know, so these are these are not these are not disjoint problems really, and uh, uh, like like I like I uh, joke about sometimes only only half in jest is that if we if we figure out the four inches of topsoil, I think I think we'll solve you know the next uh, four thousand problems that we're facing. So um, uh, of course the transition is a big problem because a lot of the downsides. Uh, we are seeing both in soil issues, in agriculture issues, uh, as well as in climate issues, right? Uh, they are actually not first order problems. They happen. They happen as a consequence in the th in the in the third order of things, in the in the seventh order, right? But but uh, the problems we face, the resistance we face, uh, the income resistance, the the habits that have gotten formed, the uh, you know the state incentives. All of those are very first order here and now things. So you're trying to uh, get to better outcomes, but uh, the the question on income is very interesting. For in, uh, instance, um, if you if you uh, preserve income for today, but lose it over a seven year period because your uh, let's say your groundwater runs dry completely, so have you actually preserved the income, or have you actually just uh, front loaded it a little bit? You know, so we're trying to take a whole systems view of this. The the battle between the first order and the nth order is a complex one, right? And we have to handhold, we have to fund that transition, we have to provide support as in, as as consumers, as uh, states, as uh, civil society through that transition, because uh, the uh, nth order effects are really really scary at this point of time, and uh, I, I I personally and and. We as an institution don't think we have more than 10 years to start making the transition at scale. The good news is a lot of people are involved, a lot of efforts are out there. And in fact, we are taking that approach that, you know, we need less uh, inventing right now. We need less uh, new innovation. What we need, really need is for the proven methods, for the uh, existing solutions. And it, it better be like a forest of ideas, like Jasmir was saying, well, one size will not fit all. Right? We need all of these to get to the mainstream now. We need the research to happen to link food and nutrition to health and uh, incomes. We need to understand the village economy from a cost side as, as much as from the uh, revenue side, because in the gap is where income lies really. So I think a lot of this research is pending, but um, and uh, but the good good thing is that enough people are engaged in this today. So yeah. Samir, uh, I think uh, you, you touched on some problem, but I'll probe you further for a couple of more things, and, and that will start the second round of the conversation. I think uh, the two points that you made, one is that 
less focus on research and more into kind of replicating the proven methods goes very well. That's one. Second is that uh, we need to make this mainstream and, 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 and that's the only way out. Uh, it, it cannot be a, a, a parallel stream running saying that some agriculture would be regenerative and others would be non-regenerative for a lack of better word. Uh, but I think, uh, I, I, as you hinted out, that uh, the economics of the regenerative agriculture, the technology mix, the behavioral challenges, and the market, right? These are all having some impact on the mainstreaming of the regenerative agriculture. Uh, and, and, and I just want you to kind of focus on the two major challenges, two or three major challenges. For example, if we have to prioritize, if this community, which is now a continuously growing community of researchers, investors, entrepreneurs, uh, you know, and uh, bureaucrats who are looking at these as a new policy dimensions, if we can think of three, four problems that we need to solve, you know, uh, so that we can start, you know, channelizing our effort and getting the momentum around that because some problems as you are saying that some problem uh, are down the road that need to be solved after we have solved some initial problems. For example, I, I would say that, uh, and I'm just not coloring your thoughts, but just giving one perspective is that, you know, when we talk about regenerative agriculture promotion or, or making it work is that, can we work with all the big institutions working on agriculture and transforming them saying that you need to now talk about regenerative agriculture right adopt these practices right now but i'll i'll kind of push this question to you that you know if you have to look at the two three major challenges that we need to kind of prioritize what could be those uh, you want me to go first on this yeah 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 so to start with we uh, we realized very quickly that uh, problem solving in silos uh, uh, eventually leads to a pilot that dies after the project is over Right. Uh, somebody famously described uh, India as a landscape of pilots, uh, graveyard of pilots. Right. Uh, and we realized that was really, really true in, in many cases. Yeah. So we, so if you, if you look at the architecture of the green revolution, for instance, a whole bunch of things happen sim simultaneously that actually created a massive behavior change, you know, from policy to uh, input support, to institutions supporting it, to uh, R and D, uh, supporting it and so on and so forth, right? Um, so you have to take an ecosystem view of it because ecosystems survive. Single point solutions never survive. If, if, if you have everything in the mix, but you don't have the energy problem solved and uh, you know, post-production facilities fall uh, uh, flat because you know, they don't have access to energy, you're not going to solve the problem. If you, if you have everything but you don't either create local markets or uh, market access elsewhere. In fact, you need both, right? You're not going to solve the problem. If, if there is no know-how on storage for critical bits, if there's no uh, technology available for, uh, let, let's say, some commodity or, or some value-added commodity needs uh, uh, cooling solutions, if that is not available, you're going to miss out on value addition, right? So you, you actually need to understand things from a from eco, ecosystem perspectives, dry land, wetland, millet, bamboo, uh, what have you, right? Uh, try to diversify them as much. Try to re rank the uh, ecosystems for outcomes in terms of the ecological outcomes, in terms of the income outcomes, in terms of the um, you know, health nutrition outcomes and so on and so forth. You may have different targets, right? And the solutions will actually emerge from will emerge ground up. There, there's a whole bunch of tools available and we don't have to apply the same tools the same way in every sub-region and geography that we go into. So that's that's the thesis we arrived at and we're trying to push uh, as uh, wide pushes, uh, you know, not, not as uh, five pilots here and three villages there, but as, as a uh, method to actually start scaling across, across the board. Uh, in terms of, uh, is it okay if I just do a screen share? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. So in, in, in terms of the, uh, one sec. Yeah, in, in terms of how these solutions stack up, actually the, uh, there was an interesting uh, session done uh, recently by uh, Socrates, who we are working with as well. Um, so they sat, they actually did this with a whole bunch of uh, different uh, 
uh, stakeholders and uh, what are the shifts needed in this right so so uh, to start with there are existing models out there so they were working with the rysis model uh, and uh, but, but there are a whole bunch of models like this so how do you how do you actually start pushing you know knowledge and awareness of this um how do you start you know understanding agricultural from a research and learning point of view like i said the, the nutrition the nutrition health relationship is not very well understood there are still debates around you know uh, so pe- pe- people say organic is expensive for instance today but if you if you account for the uh, input cost if you account for the eventual healthcare costs it looks it's a very very different picture that emerges but we don't have good enough data on all this right uh, then of course there is uh, uh, the consumer side of things right the for in a city like bangalore there is a substantial demand for this now but it's not it's not uh, it's not the majority it's not the mainstream and outside of bangalore it's not still not that big how do you actually build consumer preferences and demands both uh, both in the big cities as well as in local markets for for this so like uh, uh, we saw one experiment where they just branded it in the village uh, you know they just went out and said this is poison free food and that really hit home you know nobody wants to eat uh poison food after that and uh, finally uh, you know the hand holding will actually need a, a lot of uh, payment for ecosystem services and uh, other costs that are paid right now but, but nobody is accounting for it right if you if you want the ecosystem surviving you need to you need to pitch in for it one way or the other as consumer as a state as a collective so i think i think a bunch of these things are needed and uh, of course this this happened in a short uh, a uh, session and uh, they they discovered a certain you know, there was a certain sense of how this timeline will emerge but uh, all of these things are needed and, and and as we start to understand an ecosystem some parts of the ecosystem will be stronger some will be weaker and and we apply these methods uh i still think the most important thing like i said is this appearing like a mainstream somebody actually said that maybe uh 12% of india is in one way organic or natural or whatever right that's that's not a small number for for food and and we need to really highlight that and we really really need to start understanding what that means in terms of other outcomes right there is enough data that proves that uh, uh it is not low yield it is not poor in terms of incomes Uh, you're growing three crops a year, or or you're growing all around the year compared to just one rain-fed crop. Um, we also have to be opportunistic in where we start this process. Like rain-fed areas have their backs against the wall already; the soils are already dead. Right, the potential for change and the uh, the desire to experiment there is already high compared to irrigated areas and uh, you know water-rich areas. So maybe that's the opportunity where you need to start with. So. yeah I, th- i think it's a it's a process but there are enough knowns on the table that we can start running with thanks amir i think uh, the point you made that if you understand the top 4 inches of the soil a lot of problems will be solved i think there is a brilliant book uh, i think my favorite uh, the book is called the soil will save us uh, it's by uh, you know christine uh, i think olson uh, and there's a brilliant book about the importance of soil which regenerative agriculture focuses a lot on uh i think i'll move to my next speaker uh to just made uh just made i think uh, just wanted to get uh your thoughts on what are the two three major challenges you know which we face when we think of uh, making the regenerative agriculture mainstream or making a transition uh, of certain kind of practices so if you can highlight about a couple of challenges or, or three challenges that you see are the most uh, critical i think uh the point i am seeing uh, which samir did not highlight uh, explicitly but what he was saying that that there are a lot of things that we can do but probably they are not known to many people very few people are doing those things uh, is this true uh, do you find it as a ignorance or not awareness about certain practices that challenge or you find something else that is even bigger uh, you know deterrent uh, in achieving what we set out to achieve 
Sure. Um, I think, yes, I mean, did touch on a few things which are extremely pertinent to note um, because we've been already discovering that even in our early explorations uh, in Madhya Pradesh. One is, yes, I think when you approach a, a rain-fed farming scenario, um, it's not soil that the farmers speak about first, right? But to even move into a regenerative system where you're talking about practices like cover crops all year round, uh, crop rotations, it's water that's the essential resource. Uh, so when we look at this at a landscape level, even in our local application of um, all the theory and recommended practices around region agriculture, we can't disconnect water as a starting point in India. And that is basically our entry level uh, support. Um, I think one uh, aspect around a significant gap um, that we've seen is definitely there is a period of transition. Um, to really help farmers move that needle and transition to a more regenerative system. I think that's what I want to sort of flag here. When we look at a regenerative system, uh, very, you know, sort of uh, technically speaking, there are two aspects that you want to shift. You want to, yes, make the soil more fertile um, and look at soil management, plant nutrition, all those components. But you also want to improve the diversity and the, the you know, diversity within their farming system. And what we've essentially seen is, um, at least from the, the modeling that we've done, even across our coffee programs and so on, is that there is perhaps not always uh, enough either information, data, capture of impact that can straight away say that there is a short term business case to do it. So what happens is that, yes, the data and the insight will tell us how things pan out in maybe four, five or more years. But what happens in year one, year two, year three is that that is where the investment is needed the most, either in terms of you know, capital investments, either in terms of bridging income gaps, which means that you need a different sort of incentive structure to kick in in the short term while we wait for the true impact of region ag to reveal itself in four to five, maybe longer years to come. And that is what is the biggest struggle. Who are the short term supporters of this shift? You know, what kind of impact funding, incentive structures, banks willing to step up, look at credit scoring differently, how can we get creative, but also collaborative to assess risk differently, maybe through our project anchors for the short term, keeping a longer term horizon in mind. And I think that is one of the, the significant question marks and therefore challenges uh, for us to address regenerative agriculture at scale uh, in India and in most of our landscapes where we do you know, work with rain-fed farmers. Thanks, Asmir. Uh, I, I think I'll move to uh, Gajananji for uh, a very special uh, kind of question is that, you know, they work with uh, uh, more than a million farmers and, and uh, often you are kind of introducing uh, innovative practices, innovative technologies or uh, transitioning farmers from their age old practices to a new way of doing agriculture. Now, I want you to focus on that whether you know a particular kind of challenge emerges as the key challenge every time for example it is it the behavior it is the knowledge uh, that is missing or it is the economics because i think both jasmeer and samir are highlighting that we need to achieve this at a scale uh, and and for this to be achieved at a scale we need to get those institutions who are right now working with a large number of farmers to move towards that and i think uh, uh, TRF having you know uh, programs which are touching more than a million households uh, is a good starting point. I think the SMEAR is working in Madhya Pradesh in one value chain, but there are several value chains that could be transformed if we identify the uh, you know the practices there and the stakeholders who are working with them. So Gajananji, if you look at the transition need that we're talking about, a if we know the practices, if if Samir uh, has a list of practices that have been proven that can be scaled out, uh, we know that what needs to be done. If we go with those practices to a farmer saying that we want you to switch from A to B, and we also prove that there is a, a transition plan for you, there is a kind of support available to you, what do you think would be a 
challenge. Is there any insight from the field work that you have uh, been doing? Yeah, certainly. So the challenges that we face basically is convincing a farmer to switch from the regular, you know, uh, the way they were practicing agriculture, moving to a regenerative uh, practices. So what uh, we did was that because we're working closely with the NRLM, we're closely around uh, almost one crore, I mean, 100,000 farmers are there. In NRLM itself, we try to create a, a, a package of practices on non-pesticide management. So we call it as NPM handbook. So that's that's the starting point where we tried at the policy level that if uh, every farmer who is promoted through the NRLM uh, ecosystem are actually trained or capacitated around these practices, which we call as NPM, in a very uh, simple language so that they understand key why it is important to adopt such practices and how in the long term they are going to get uh, better outcome from these interventions. So that's one area which we supported in RLM and it is across the country, it is being circulated to the SRLMs and uh, uh, yeah, so that is one area. Second is that NRLM here also learn, implements a program called as MKS, Mahila Kisan Sasakti Karan Pariyosna. So there the entire uh, guideline and initiatives, which are, whichever is uh, done through the system, is uh, specifically prioritizing organic uh, farming. But the core challenge that we face on ground is that though we have promoted uh, many of these initiatives, but the challenge is that at the village level, the, the production amount is very less. You know? And farmers who actually uh, do that production, so it is very difficult for them to uh, connect with the market, negotiate with uh, the market players. So that is one area. That's why what we try to do here is that uh, based on our field experiences, uh, I actually came up with a, a small business case solutions for uh, around 10 to 15 farmers. If they are uh, producing organic or they are practicing NPM, then how, how they can actually collectivize their production and can sell it into the market. So there are very small, small interventions. For example, people need to understand how to do a registration for a small business entity. Then there are the issues of how to access uh, to specific schemes which promote uh, organic farming. People might not be knowing about that. So these are the deficiencies that we found. Uh, so access to finance is one area. And then uh, registration of a uh, business entity is something that we thought is uh, uh, people in ground are actually not uh, very much uh, uh, aware about it. And then uh, how to take loan from the bank for you know for a, uh, for improving their production or scaling that uh, that practices in a larger uh, area. So these are few of the um, challenges that we faced while working with the community, and we are coming up with a compendium of around ten such small business case solutions, which uh, you know, farmers who are involved in to uh, organic farming and are adopting NPM can actually take benefit from that. So I think uh, convincing them that shifting is important, why it is important, and in the long run, how it is going to benefit. That's one challenge which we try to do for a lot of community engagement. And uh, second is uh, about creating small business case solutions. But the core is that wherever we approach to the farmers, we never say to them that you shift or jump uh, for a that, That's a gradual process and it takes time so we don't uh, tell them that uh, you have to completely shift, but slowly and slowly, once they understand, so uh, they do that. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dharanji. I think uh, 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 the point I have been trying to kind of uh, bring home uh, again and again, I guess, uh, Samir and just made it that the institutions which are working with, you know, uh, Crowd farmers, you know, and, and they are doing certain uh, initiatives. For example, the NPM handbook. I think I'm visualizing a scenario where some of the proven techniques can go into that handbook, and suddenly they reach the one crore farmers and they start working on that. Uh, the challenges of financing, the challenges of uh, hand holding support to them is going to be there because not everyone is going. Again, I think uh, what Gajananji also hinted at the. Of fragmented production systems, like you know, you have a very fragmented uh, production. You have to aggregate that to make it, you know, fit premium in the market, uh, which is something that uh, you know is being done. Uh, 
But uh, there is a one dimension. I think I'm also looking at the questions coming to the chat box, which some of you are answering. But one question that uh, caught my attention is that, uh, you know, there are a lot of discussions about the regenerative agriculture producing certain outcomes, be it this, you know, soil restoration or the water conservation or the improvement in the biodiversity or any kind of, uh, you know, Samir, you also talked about payment for ecosystem services, right? And, and, uh, uh, and this is the kind of entire push coming from that angle that how these practices can contribute to certain uh, ecosystem benefits. Now, the challenge is that those benefits either are going to be recognized by the consumers of those region products or by the large society that value that there is a, a, a kind of something being generated that need to be paid for. Now, in the current system, that is very, very convoluted. Uh, I, I I work in the carbon finance space. I can go, you know, hours talking about the complexity there. Um, I don't want to go there, but what I'm going to focus on that is one very simple thing is that, uh, uh, just me, you also mentioned about the baseline for the uh, farmers, because when you're measuring, re you know, results, you are looking at a baseline. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's a question saying that, what is the difference between the conventional practices and the regenerative practices? We don't have a baseline. You know, to, if we go and say that, okay, I have switched, I'm doing things better, uh, and I have generated this benefit, it, the claims are not going to be, you know, realized in the way that somebody is willing to pay for that. Is there a way that we are realizing the benefits of regenerative agriculture and saying that this is how we will reward it? Because right now it's a more of a, you know, a wish that we have the farmers can become more climate resilient, you will produce better quality food. But, uh, and we are saying that somebody will pay better for that, for the food. But if your practices are not resulting into a market product that is fetching premium, then you are on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, I would kind of, this is my last question and I would jump to the uh, question, but I want uh, each of my speakers to highlight that if there is something that they are doing, where they are thinking of rewarding the farmers or providing them some kind of incentive to the investment and to the outcome that they have generated. Uh, through the regenerative uh, practices. Uh, just made if I may start with you. Sure. I think there are a few because we're really looking at this as a core objective of our landscape program in Madhya Pradesh. How do we get more farmers to transition? How do we measure what progress has been made? And then how do we solution for innovative ways to reward that change? I think the, the it's always a situation where the change has to be seen for it to be rewarded and in the interim what you can do is make it easier for that change to happen uh, through other forms of uh, upfront financing which comes either from catalytic funders it comes from preferential financial institutions who will value uh, the sort of green approach towards uh, farming in, the, in that particular case. I think you picked up something very uh, particular, Santosh, also talking about carbon financing and so on. And I think we've also very early on uh, realized that even though there is potential in carbon financing, it's not going to meet the entire cost of transitioning farmers to region agriculture. So those needs that are needed upfront um, either in the form of bridging income gaps or working capital or investment in capital costs, which are required, those still have to be met. And in our landscape program, what we're looking at is how can we better converge them, right? So how do we make it easier for a government to invest in that particular region? How do we uh, use, for example, catalytic funding to de-risk some of the investment of financial institutions towards farmer lending to, with that objective of that lending being geared towards adoption of regenerative practices, while we as a program have to focus on capturing that, that particular impact. I think the third tool that we're really looking to use, because we are talking about a jurisdictional sourcing. So this is where the private sector sort of incentive kicks in because we are looking at essentially verifying a region uh, in the future, right? That's the big vision based on parameters of performance on sustainability as well as on region act. So what this would mean is that technology would need to kick in in terms of setting that baseline. That's the process that we're undergoing now. Um, but in the future, how do we attract more private sector to step up and then preferentially take sourcing decisions because of 
a, you know, a system which shows better impact in that landscape. And that could come in either in forms of credits, but it would also come in terms of sourcing relationships, upfront financial investments, better credit terms, all of those things sort of kick in. So those are some of the you know, particular areas in which we're focusing on. But of course, there is no magic solution today. These are all very much works in progress for us as well. But it's an exciting place to be because uh, definitely there's a lot of potential for innovation around solutions here. Thank you, Shmir. Uh, may I move to uh, Samir? Samir, just kind of thinking on the same line what I asked for, Jasmir, is that uh, when is there a way to reward the region farmers? Uh, that, and, and if there is, what we need to do that to make it seamless. It should not be whims and fancy of the system. People should be aware that if I create this value, I would be rewarded, you know, because that that would is out thing. I completely understand the you know inadequacy of the carbon money or the climate finance or payment of ecosystem services to cover the entire cost. But this might be very instrumental in covering the gap that initially occurs when the transition is start to happen. Your thoughts on so to start with, like just just uh, in terms of PES, uh, we have instances where the PES uh, required was zero. In one case, it's ten thousand bucks a year, and it it you know and, and there's more. So uh, I'm going to sidestep your question a little bit, to be honest. Okay, no, no problem. Uh, because I th I think I think we have to stop hunting, uh, stop looking for silver bullets. Yeah. You have to stop looking for. Uh, too long have uh, both uh, uh, government programs and uh, large, you know, civil society programs gone down with top-down solutions, right? Like this is my design, take this and run with it, right? This will work. I think those assertions are just bad. I'm, I'm a permaculture practitioner and I understand how in a forest, different trees, different layers all adopt different strategies. Right? It, it will vary even from one cluster of villages to another. Right? It cannot definitely work across different bioregions. And, you know. So what we can do is go in with the Swiss Army knife of toolkits. The trouble today is the availability of these toolkits uh, in an easy to consume form is difficult. You know, if, if there's some, something um, uh, IDH has worked with, I, 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 and, and if, if, I, if I see an applicability, let's say, uh, in the Bandipur landscape, I don't know how to apply it quickly, right? If if uh, somebody there has collectivized using, uh, uh, you know, on the on the forest boundary, the electric fence is a great tool. If somebody's done a trade with the farmers to collectivize based on that, I don't know how how to apply it elsewhere very quickly. Right? The market is super efficient at that, and we've seen examples. We've actually invested in market, uh, you know, market facing companies as well, um, Organic Mandya and Akshay Kalpa and a few others. Who have actually scaled efforts to go natural and go organic across their districts, convinced hundreds of farmers. Uh, their tool was, of course, because they were closer to uh, Bangalore and they had market, they could create market access. So that was the incentives. They didn't need to do, actually do any payment for ecosystem services outside of that. Right. So the tools will vary. In 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 cases where uh, farmers were, you know, especially at the edge of the forest where they had abandoned their land, they were at zero crops a year or maybe one rain fed crop a year to move that to one to two to three itself was the incentive. You know, the, so the fence played a role in some cases, uh, availability of uh, um, seeds in one case played a major role. So there are you know, availability of water, like uh, just may said. Uh, so uh, rejuvenation of a uh, 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 lake system in one case actually played a major role. So the, so the starting points and the interventions have been different, but finally you land into an ecosystem and you dig deeper into it and you deepen the ecosystem in all directions. So the availability of this toolkit, going in and discovering what fits in this particular, I would say village, not even like a cluster of villages, is, is, is what we really need to do here. Uh, technology has a role to play, energy has a role to play, uh, creation, uh, you know, price discovery has a role to play. So we are, we are trying to push for a, a large common mark, a marketplace, which is like public commons, uh, where this can be done. Uh, we've seen various things work in various places. Honestly, there's really no one size fits all. So um, I, I, would, I would say, don't if you, if you, if you swoop in with you know we will we will provide incentives. Sometimes you don't need to. 
you know, it'll, it'll become too expensive a method. Uh, no amount of uh, uh, carbon credits or payment for ecosystem services can actually account for the ecological services that we really need to create. The, the economy doesn't have it in it, right? We actually need to, uh, you know, we, we, need, we need to create a thousand units of ecological services for a unit of the economy to run. And we are just trying to uh, hack our way through it. We are trying to, we're trying to be opportunistic in how we find this. I mean, that has, that needs to happen at scale. Thanks, I mean, I, I'll touch base on the point uh, there, but I think I, uh, you know, it, it, the view Samir is kind of highlighting is that regenerative agriculture is rewarding in itself in many cases, and we should focus on that. And uh, the other means can come and support you, but that should not be the motive for starting regenerative agriculture, right? That, that's the message. So that's why I think the questions on the carbon finance, you should not do it because there is a carbon finance available. You should do it and probably carbon finance will come to you. That, that, that's the question rather than saying that, okay, I cannot start because the carbon finance mechanisms are convoluted or not available or, or the support is not available. Gajananji, a quick remark from you. In, in many of the farmers that you are working with, has there been a very significant kind of uh, demand for a particular type of support? Uh, you know, because I think uh, Samir hinted at creating a marketplace which basically gives the price discovery to the farmers or bringing other mechanisms. So in your cases, is there something that has been the, uh, you know, big, big ask from your farmers that this is what we need? And, and, and when you have given that, it has great transformational uh, impact. Is there something that we can learn from you? Yeah, so I think uh, one learning that we had is about the shifting from, I mean, uh, that is a creating a balance between agriculture and horticulture. That's, that's a clear shift that we are observing. People are more interested to go for short-term horticulture clubs and vegetables because of income uh, enhancement. That is one area. And one more area which I think uh, people are highly interested in is having an integrated uh, farming system. I mean, the existing resources they have, a pond, there is a pond, there are a few animals, they have uh, uh, burns and the way the farm pond is being created. So, 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 in, so if you will see the Mahatma Gandhi NRHS program in the, that spends around 65% of its budget towards natural resource management. But there they have come up with a system called as uh, climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure for uh, the community. So whatever assets are being created, be it a farm pond, be it a water harvesting structure. So there those uh, uh, climate uh, resident factors are being included. And I think people are uh, learning slowly and slowly that we need to practice all that, that, that way we can reduce our soil degradation, that way we can uh, reduce our wastage and can also bring circularity in agriculture. So I think uh, slowly and slowly it is gaining pace. That's a observation from our end. Thank you. I, I think that also goes and uh, you know corroborates what Samir and others are saying that if people start kind of seeing the tractions, they will start demanding those things and moving towards that. So. Uh, you know, and th that's, uh, I think, Samir, the, the point you have been making about the best practices being known to everyone, the best practices be it into the program design, implementation, the, the different kind of nuances to different value chains should be known to everyone, and then they can pick and choose what works best for them in what context. I think uh, uh, the summarizing some of the key pointers and then uh, going to the uh, Q&A from the audience, there are some questions that I would like you to kind of uh, provide some input on. One thing I think the session wanted to achieve is that, that there is a place for regenerative agriculture and it is going to be moving up and up and become mainstream. That's point one. I think we all agree that the discussion that I'm having in chat box shows that, that there is an increased amount of awareness about this new uh, you know, way of doing agriculture that is more climate friendly and people are working on that. That's A. B, there are a number of best practices that are already emerging that need to be scaled out, uh, you know, that need to be scaled up for uh, different kind of sectors, different kind of geography, different kind of ecological, uh, agroecological zones. So, so that's second part. Third part is that there are multiple institutions, uh, technologies and market that need to play a role to make it mainstream. Those are still emerging out. I think uh, there is no universal price discovery mechanism. There is no universal market for that. It's a uh, uh, kind of geography focus, value chain focus, but those are emerging. So uh, eventually we'll see that 
they will converge. Third is that that uh, the transition has a cost, and and somebody need to kind of cover the cost. Uh, uh, obviously, the benefits completely outweigh the cost. There is no question about that. The kind of been, but somebody need to factor that in, and 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 there. Uh, the point Samir is making that you know the in the long run, you do regenerative agriculture for its long term benefit and not looking because there is some incentive available right now because that would be a wrong approach that might not uh, go well because sometimes the incentive change and then the motivation to adopt that uh, goes there. I can give you an example of the five years back or, or say a decade back carbon market when the carbon market crashed everything came to a halt. So, so these are the some takeaway point, and I think the one takeaway point that I would like to reiterate to the audience who are in there, uh, you know, uh, if I take the liberty of highlighting that, uh, you know, just made Samir and Gajananji all have been working in different dimensions. People can reach out to that, and at least I'm seeing that there is an increased awareness. Uh, I think uh, just may correct me if I'm wrong, but IDH is now aggressively focusing on building the marketplace, building the kind of uh, knowledge about uh, regenerative agriculture. Doing programs on the ground, so so there are a lot of things happening, and you can provide a lot of information to the uh, uh, audience. The RF is doing a lot of work in how to scale up those practices, so they can provide some input. Samir is talking about. So I want this discussion to be kind of getting into the direction that audience, the participant, can reach out to us and provide uh, you know get some input, and and we can work with them. With that, let me move to the, some of the question that we are having. Some of the questions we have already touched upon, but I think I'm just reiterating so that you can briefly answer or add additional, uh, you know, kind of dimension to that. Uh, there are some question marked to specific uh, speakers, but some are general. Uh, the one question I think uh, 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 from Mustika is saying that, are there any successful models in incentivizing farmers to change their behavior? Uh, that's one point. Second, successful models pathway best practices to, uh, you know, change consumer behaviors towards the product they are consuming. So they demand more region products uh, and, and that creates the demand for that. Uh, and uh, if there are, how they can be possibly replicated? Uh, you know, I think some part we have discussed, but uh, just made a quick uh, uh, remark from you. Is there any uh, source where they can go and see? I know that there are, but is there any source that could be easily uh, you know, available? Samir, it gets back to the point that you are making. There is no one place where I can say, go to this website or get to that, uh, you know, you can get that. But uh, just made a uh, quick remark on that. Sure. I mean, I think there are two questions in there, right? One is the successful models on incentivizing farmers to change their behavior. And I mean, I have to come back to at least the way we approach it at IDH, and which is why you will find that information. And I'm happy to share a couple of links uh, now and post. But we really do approach it as a, a business uh, entry point, right? So how do we make it easier for farmers to adopt uh, those practices? And that basically comes at looking at innovative financing or value chain financing to enable it. We, of course, as a, um, as a I would say, catalytic uh, funder or enabler of that, look at different sort of mechanisms around de-risking what would be for different financial institutions to come forward and support farmers to do that. Um, on the second part, which is about consumer behavior changes, it's a funny thing because we've been, I think, discussing this already for a number of years, and it truly depends on which sector or consumer you are really talking to, right? Um, I think sitting uh, where we have colleagues and programs all over the world and definitely some of those consumer behaviors that shape uh, a lot of their purchasing and consuming habits in some countries more than others. I think we were grappling in India yesterday the fact that for us, a large number of our consumers um, firstly still need to be made aware and then, of course, still need to solve for the fact that they may take a preferential decision, perhaps, but being a very price sensitive consumer in a country like India means that when premiums of a large, you know, delta kick in, that's where it, things could again, you know, slow down. But however, I think there is enough research out there, you know, a quick search yesterday for us also revealed the fact that at least if made aware, a preferential decision between products that have lower impact, for example, with a minor, you know, sort of uh, ability to pay more 
is something that's growing uh, and trending as uh, you know what's seen in india as well and this we're talking about beyond key cities or large cities etc and we're already seeing a little bit more conscious consumer not at the pace at which we would like to see but it's happening i think a large part of the onus santosh is also on um i think the companies themselves making their consumers aware so increasingly you see lot of private sector partners talking about their brands with a purpose or what lies behind their products and that itself is what needs to happen also to make consumers aware right consumers need to know what they're eating consuming buying what is the story behind that so it's a it's a bit of both um unfortunately no clear answer um on that one but at least on the first question business case for us right how do we make it work in terms of numbers before we expect incentives just me since i have you on the spot so uh, one quick question which could be a very informative for many of the participant is the question on that can you name some of the catalytic funders some of the kind of philanthropic foundations or the institutions that are supporting vegan agriculture uh, that could be you know a go to uh, point for many of these participants so any any information on that i mean we're already working with a few in our own programs uh, so in madhya pradesh in india we uh, basically kick started an engagement with the lauders foundation uh where we're looking at very contextual models in cotton based landscape so that is essentially of course linked to business case uh you know the type of companies etc they come from in our programs in in Uganda and Kenya we're working with uh, the IKEA foundation so there are a number i don't think uh, there is any dot to be honest of organizations and funders uh, now there are you know coalitions that are formed even by private sector uh, op2b for example you know on biodiversity maybe funders are uh, you know sort of also testing waters they want to be more thorough so a lot of them are investing into uh, the modeling the numbers the common definitions which is still missing around regenerative ag but you will see that they're pushing for the principles in terms of let's say lower carbon footprint in terms of more biodiversity uh friendly supply chains and i think you'll have to look for those synonyms while the world is building a common narrative around a definition for for region act i think i'll also put rain matter foundation into that mix because they are also supporting a number of uh, initiatives so people can reach out to that uh one question uh and i would put to samir samir there's a question i think uh, uh the question uh, age primarily uh, i think it's a long question but i'm just uh, making it short that how do we push for these kind of ventures and these kind of practices when the impact investors or the investors who are looking for short term high returns and these are the practices which gear into a long journey and 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 a long term impact uh, uh and and just your thoughts on that uh, because this is a question you know uh, i i think it's very pertinent question because uh, whenever you talk about natural resources or nature based solution it's a long haul it takes a 5 year to 20 year time period to get the outcome and, and that cannot be seen into the traditional framework of you know 5 year and 6 year uh, exit routes um yeah so again uh, i'll just point out that we don't have 20 years right yeah <laughs> we strongly believe that we have to solve this within the next decade otherwise uh, yeah. we might as well like kiss it goodbye uh so yeah so one is uh, to start with you do need a lot more patient capital because these are not short term changes the the way uh, traditional investment and capital works is even even csr capital even a lot of the uh, you know civil society funding that happens has taken a very short term view today right so this needs to so one thing we are trying to do is uh, can we can we collectively uh, you know identify a few vectors along which we need to move we get very we get very uh, you know stuck on method x versus method y versus method z but when when all of them are actually aligned to the same vector you know so can we can we find a few directions along which all of us really want to move right so that whether it's funding or government or civil society or uh, businesses that work around this space etc they are all kind of aligned to it right can we identify them in a very clear visible way the second thing is uh, from a policy and legislative perspective can we increase the cost of being short term and externalizing costs 
can we can we introduce the idea of food miles traceability etc into produce can we try and you know even even something like millets it's absurd to get millets into bangalore from an orissa and an uttarakhand when i have millets within 100 kilometers 150 kilometers of where i am at in at scale right so can we introduce these ideas in product pricing in product packaging in labeling in in, in the supply chains right and introduce them in a way that's at eventually policy adopts them initially maybe a few nodes will do it maybe you know uh, even even uh, fair trade and fair pricing uh, mechanisms so we are actually trying to push it with whoever we are working with right so it's a it's a multi pronged strategy like you initially need patient capital you need to create a larger message and a larger map for people to align to and then you also need legislation to uh, disincentivize short term behavior so i think i think uh, again it will take years to do this but we got to get started on the journey one very pertinent question i think uh, somebody is drawing parallel between the green revolution and and what we try to achieve in the region and and the question is that uh, a uh, green revolution worked as it provided a simple uh, you know uh, ecosystem or simple uh, i think it says provided an ecosystem to support the transition that we are talking about that do we have the ecosystem right now uh, for uh, transition to regenerative agriculture one by one we but we we agree that we need that ecosystem really much uh, sooner than what we could uh, do okay uh last question uh, i think we have covered many of the questions i'm not great in getting each of the question there is a question on uh what kind of technologies what kind of uh, best practices uh, software etc is needed or, or is available to help the transition i think uh, uh i would do a plug for the session that is happening at 4 uh that session basically talks about the ectech 4.0 and that is primarily looking at not only the technologies and solution that can you know help farmers but also technology and solution that could enable farmers uh, you know enable us to serve the farmer better for example you know we were drawing parallel between if the google map would have not been there we all would have not seen the uber and the ola and the swiggy and all this thing somebody got the google map and then we saw similarly if tomorrow we get a satellite based imagery that gives the a uh, farm level data about that thing then multiple solutions and multiple things can be built up so ect 4.0 would have lot of role to play in the way region agriculture is going to be in future so i would request that for those who are interested in that join that session uh, the session would be led by uh, you know we have world bank uh, talking about some of their recent initiatives on the ect uh, ect 4.0 they are working with google and others so we love to have some engaging discussion from entrepreneurs from the ecosystem makers and you know uh, a number of other stakeholders i think that's uh, primarily i think uh, i see from the question point of view many of the questions i think we have covered but i think to just uh, uh, a big thank you to all the participant in this world where we are completely fatigued by so many webinars happening i see 86 people participating in this that's a big on this at least uh, zoom i'm not counting the other platforms we are running and the, the quality of questions and the engagement that i saw on the chat box is absolutely amazing that talks a lot about what kind of uh, you know uh, interest the region agriculture or the agriculture age kind of generating and and there are many people who would come up with solutions and will work on that uh, i request that uh, you know if you have any questions uh, you know my team uh from intellicap and uh, trif team they are all kind of working on different dimensions and they would be happy to connect with you uh, as well as jasmeer and samir have shared their email addresses and they are looking forward to that samir i think uh, i love to have the conversation where we have a next step or something that concrete we take it for the for the future i think i will connect base with you and others to see that if we can develop a repository of the best practices that could seed the conversation so probably we can talk to idhu and couple of other institution working on there they're saying that hey, here are the best practices because that would be very easy for me to have the best practice and give it to gajanan ji and saying that why don't you take it to the uh, you know 10 million farmers that you are serving so so with this uh, thank you very much to all the participants to my panelists to all the people who have been you know kind of contributing to region agriculture space and who have been here uh, we look forward Uh, to for uh, for the more conversation on digital agriculture as well as on the different tracks uh, uh, on agriculture and climate friendly agriculture 
uh, thank you very much. Uh, look forward to having you at the Sankalp and seeing you in the other session that we are running for next uh, three days. Thank you.